Deuteronomy lesson three, what does the Lord require from his people? Kind of interesting thing to think of. So let's start with prayer. Almighty and most merciful father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy name, laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared to all the people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. All right, I saw Anna. Hi, Anna. And I saw Hi, Twyla. How y'all doing? Good. How are you? I'm, well, you guys are just keeping me on track. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Twyla and Ann, do you remember Cindy Capps? Yes. She just had a kidney transplant. Did you know that? No. I did not either. Yeah, I got no. a text from her um, a couple of days ago, and she goes, doing well after surgery, going home soon. The <laughs> kidney started working before she even got it put in her, you know. And, and I said, well, that's great. I didn't even know you're having a transplant. Oh. So, but anyway, she's doing well. It was uh, from her nephew, who's 46 years old. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad she's doing well. I know. I know. Yeah. So as a review, get out your at a glance chart. See how beautiful mine is? I thought I'd let you see what I actually do. So you can say, oh, she's a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> but on I can't just, even see I can't even see the writing with my glasses on. Well, so. You can just see the, you know, you can see how I write. <laughs> Ram things in there. <laughs> But anyway, chapter one, what do you have down as the um, chapter theme for chapter one? Israel's history, Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. Yep. How about chapter two? Israel's history, Kadesh to Gal uh, Gilead. Gilead, yeah. How about three? Somebody else. I Somebody else I know has this done, right? Israel's history from Basham to the valley opposite Beth Peor. There you go. Somebody's writing down what I did, right? Which I just no. wrote down what <laughs> Teresa says. <laughs> That's All where right. I wrote it down from. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Four. So you know where I'm getting it from, right? Is it commandment, statutes, God's nation? There you go. No gods besides God. He's a jealous and compassionate God. How about five? The Ten Commandments. There you go. Hold that on one should be easy, right? Uh -huh. Yep. Also in Exodus 20. So, and I just remember that at the top of my head. How about six? Hear the commandments, keep them, and teach to your children. There you go. Seven. God will clear away the nations, make no covenant with them. Mm hmm And how about eight? Oh, no. Never forget what God has done. Yeah. Yeah. He led them for 40 years. Don't forget him in the land <laughs> when you get there, right? Yeah. All right, so around this time, what time frame were we looking at in there? This is a when and who. After the 40 years uh, to the second generation. Yes, second generation, good. Because the Lord killed the first generation, right? Yep. I was thinking this last night. I go, okay, if they were 20 years and they went around for 40 the youngest men would have died at 60 years old. That's pretty young, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially for them because, you know, they live 150 years or something like that. So. Well, Moses lived well, 120, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and a lot of them because of the rebellion got, you know, eaten up into the ground alive and 
attacked with plagues and all of that kind of stuff for their rebellion in the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the snakes. Don't forget the snakes. They had, they had fought two kings and defeated them and the uh, Amorites, and they camped in the land they had taken on the east side of the Jordan River. So that's where they were. And that just, there was just warnings repeated throughout De Deuteronomy. That's why Moses was telling this story over again, wasn't it? Because he was trying to say, okay, remember what happened to your parents or your grandparents, right? Yeah. So that brings us to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 9. What do you have down as the chapter theme, theme for ch chapter 9? I came up with the Lord will Israel. Okay, anyone else? I said God and the people. Okay. But it's due to their wickedness, not our right, not the Israeli's righteousness. Yeah, hmm. and that's 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 the important thing, I think, don't you? Yeah, and they were still rebellious and, and provoked at God to wrath. You can use your, um, wait a minute, let me go back to that. The map here um, and the insights on God. That's supposed to be in quote right there, but I'm, oh no, it, from Deuteronomy. Yeah, that's a page that you should be filling out as we go about God, what you learn about God. So in Deuteronomy, verses one through three, what was it, what were those? verses about I said God is crossing over before you yeah what did it say about the other nations they're mighty and greater than you mm -hmm. they have great well, cities <laughs> God mm -hmm. is doing the destroying not them yeah God's yeah they were going to, they were greater and mightier. They had fortified cities. <coughs> they were giants, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And the Lord was going to go before them as a consuming fire and would destroy the Anakin and any others in the land. I read that, that article that you sent us on the Anakin. Mm -hmm. It's like, good grief. You know, these people were huge and they were. Anyway, never mind. When we get to <laughs> chapter six of Genesis, we're going to be learning a lot more about that. So, would this would this be of the same people like Goliath? Was it, would he been would he have been that of that tribe? Yes. Okay. Verses four and five. When did we learn in four and five? These are important verses. I put God is going to drive out the nations because of their wickedness, not because of Israel's righteousness. Yeah, and that's the nation's wickedness, not because of Israel's righteousness, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Because of covenant. Yeah, covenant. The oath. I always mark oath the same as I do covenant. Yeah. That he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those three names should roll off your lips. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is righteous and keeps his promises. He's the only one that does, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that's always comforting <clears throat> me about God, you know? Verses 6 through 29, what did we learn? What did we learn about the people, the Israelites? Rebellious. <laughs> Short memory. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Stubborn and rebellious. Does that sound like anyone you know? <laughs> me. Not gonna, That's not what I was going to say. That's me. <laughs> right? I have a stiff, I used to say I have a stiff neck. I'm not going to say that anymore. <laughs> uh, honestly, yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. What is it? When, what does Moses remind Israel of in these verses? That they were stubborn and rebellious. About the golden calf. Yeah. Yeah. The golden calf. Provoked, Go yeah. ahead, Cheryl. Uh, how they provoked God's wrath by 
you know, and what happened with the golden calf worshiping an image. Yeah. So he had to go up 40 days. This reminds me, you know, this guy is 80 years old, you know, mm -hmm. when he starts off with these people, right? And he goes on another 40 years and he spends 40 days and nights. This is a huge mountain, y'all. And this old man is going up and down this mountain, up and down, up and down. I find it humorous. First night he, doesn't, he doesn't ride in the car, he <laughs> walks. Yes. That makes a difference. So in verse not nine through uh, nine was the first time 60. Then God got angry enough to destroy the people and destroy Aaron. And what yeah. did Moses do? Fast. Fell on, fell on his face and prayed. Yeah. There you go. Moses before, and then he had to go back up there another 40 days and nights. Yeah. And again, he fasted. I think y'all got that right. Mm -hmm. You know, if if I was Moses, I would not be happy with Aaron because every time he left Aaron in charge, something happened. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? I mean, you know. Oh my goodness! And well, the Aaron, name Anakin. What? Go ahead, Jerry. And Aaron was the older brother, so he should have been teaching Moses instead of Moses teaching him. Correct, Jerry. But, but Moses was the chosen one, right? Yes. The name Anakin most likely means long necked or tall. The Hebrew thought them to be descendants of the Nephilim, a powerful race who dominated the pre flood world in Genesis 6 4 and Numbers 13 33. When the 12 Israelite spies returned from exploring the promised land, they gave a frightening report of people great and tall whom they uh, identified as the sons of Anakin. The Israelites seized with fear and believed themselves to be grasshoppers in their sights, according to Numbers, rebelled against God and refused to enter the land God had promised them. So, you know, and I know, I mean, I, when I was Googling these pictures, you know, I mean, there's still some people that are really, really tall. You know, you just don't know why. Most, most of them play basketball, though. Well, that's true, too. What did you learn in fa about fasting in Isaiah? This is on page 23, day five of your homework. You, God won't no notice it if you don't, if you are not living righteously and you, you shouldn't be doing it for yourself. You should be doing it, you know, as repentance or mourning. Yeah. Or yeah. like prayer. Uh-huh. What else did you learn? I also got that they, did, they didn't show kindness and mercy to others. They did it basically for themselves. Yeah. They had forsaken his ordinances. They also asked, why, why aren't you noticing me? Yeah. You know, I mean, well, I mean... If you're fasting and everything or, you know, now I can't fast because I have hyperglycemia and I would go into a, you know, insulin heyday, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people would. Um, but when you think you're really following God and you're, you think you're doing everything and you go, God, why aren't you noticing what I'm saying or asking for? Does anybody else ever think that or? Yes. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> Thank you. Don't make me feel like I'm the only one. You know, one of I the mean, churches I one of the churches I went to, the pastor had, you know, a, that was dying of cancer, and one of the um, parishioners she she fasted, and I I couldn't understand it at the time, but that's why she was doing that. She was trying to, you know, help. I think help. Yeah, you know, she was mourning and praying for his maybe recovery or, mm -hmm. you know. His answer told them information that believers need to know today about fasting. That fasting is a time for believers to humble themselves, to be bowing and mourning, as Anne said. It can also be used to loosen the bonds of wickedness and set free the oppressed, either for the one fasting or the one who the fasting is for. 
So what did what was Moses doing when he fasted? That's what we're getting at. For Israel, for the, for the people. Yeah, for Israel's sake. Yeah. Because he says when he went up there, he didn't eat or drink, right? So if a fast is not accompanied by righteous living and keeping the words, Lord's commands, it is not effective. The Lord makes no, takes no notice. So I guess, when, when do you get from that to apply to yourself? I Does think, anyone practice fasting? Go ahead, Cheryl. I, I think that fasting teaches, and this is what I've learned from our pastor, that it teaches our flesh no. Because... It, we, you know, the flesh wants what the flesh wants, but when we fast, we're teaching it, no, we can't have that. And, and uh, Denise, Dave and I fast uh, at the first of every year. And what it does is it focuses us on God yes. for the coming year. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and we practice the Daniel fast, which is just vegetables and that's all. Uh -huh. And so it's not like we're going completely without food, but we restrict ourselves to a certain type of food, and it's a time of devotion and prayer for us, and it prepares us for the year. Mm -hmm. My sister okay. and I fast from sugar during Lent, and we have for the last four or five years. Oh, that's good. Anybody else? I fasted from alcohol this Lent. Okay. Probably a good one to fast from, huh? Our church fasts also, like Karen was saying, the, Dar the Daniel fast, but we yes. teach our kids instead of doing the Daniel fast to find things in their life that they feel have taken precedent over God and fast from yep. them like video yeah. games, television, right. and then we'll help them realize how to fast and deny themselves those things to put God in his proper place. That's, Michelle, that's what our kids do too. You know, right. th the adults, I mean, at least, you know, of course, there's just the two of us now. We, do, we did have um, sons, but they're in their late 30s now, so... Um, you know, that was just, that's very important that they realize if they deny themselves, um, you know, the cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, heaven forbid, no. Well, I mean, the, you know, <laughs> it's not the cell it means phone. a lot to them. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good so God, no, I wouldn't think they would could do that. So, I, well, what did you learn in Zechariah? <laughs> You know, first of all, Israel had been taken from to Babylon for 70 years of captivity because of their continued rebellion and idolatry, after which the Lord allowed them to return to their land. And, and they were to rebuild the temple in the city of Jerusalem. So they did, they did fasting. Let's just go over that briefly. What were they fasting for and when? I got they fasted for their own reasons but not to serve God they did it self-seeking or self-serving mm -hmm. they fasted more in the fifth month because that was when Babylon was destroyed they had destroyed the temple and the city took them captive they fasted the seventh month because whoever that was was murdered then he was the one appointed by the king of Babylon as governor of Jerusalem mm -hmm. And the Lord told them through Zechariah that it had not been for him that they fasted these years in captivity. What was it for? Their own prosperity, their own good goodness, their own good life. Their own selves, right? Mm -hmm. But Moses fasted because of the people's sin. But the Israels in captivity mourned for Jerusalem and the temple rather than mourning over their sin, which had caused the destruction. See the difference? Mm -hmm. I, I thought this was interesting. A fast does not guarantee that the Almighty God will hear or answer the request of one's fasting. But he listened to Moses because his request was based on righteousness and the Lord's promises and character. 
it just makes me think, doesn't it, you? You know, of course, I don't ask for much from God because, I don't know, I grew up with the thought my mother always says, don't ask to God for things. You know, that's not what he's there for. And, you know, I mean, she kind of beat it in my head. So it's really hard for me to ask God for something. But when I do, I try to make sure that it's not based on my own fleshy, flesh desires, you know. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes, I understand. I got out of it, Denise, that so often we mourn over the consequences of sin and not the sin itself. And mm. here's a good reminder that we need to have sorrow for our sin, not mm -hmm. because of all the hardship we have because of that sin, mm -hmm. which, is what we're, which is at least what I'm so often want to do. <laughs> yeah, that's good, right? I like that. And if they pray in God's will, then, and that's what Jesus taught about, you know, that was the simple prayer that he had taught us, how it's about God's will, not our own. Yeah. And one of the reasons you study the Bible is to understand God's character, who he is, how he acts. So I pray when I, I don't usually ask for something, I usually ask for him to do his will, but when I ask for something, I usually ask, make sure it's according to his justice or his goodness yes. or his promises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you look at Zechariah 9, right, 7, 9, it says, execute, the, thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor, let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. So that was, that's all in with fasting. I guess he's saying, yeah, the, the meaning behind the fasting and, and you should do actions, right? Of these good actions, not just deny yourself, but um, do things for others, right? So what was the result of Moses fasting? This is just, what does the Bible tell us that was the result was? Well, Aaron didn't die. Yeah, that's kind of important, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> or the people. Or the people. People are wiped out. Yeah. Hi, Billy. Hi, Denise. <laughs> well, again, at um, Tabara, Tabara, Tabara. The people provoked the Lord to anger again. This was the event in 11, not Numbers 11, 3, where they had complained against the Lord and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Yeah. Another time at Massah, Massah Exodus 17, 7, they accompanied about having no, they complained, excuse me, about having no water. Moses struck the war, rock and the Lord brought water from it. Yeah. And then at Kabroth, in numbers, the people complained about the manna. So God sent the quail for them to eat. And even while the meat was still in their mouths, he sent a plague to wipe out many of them. Mm -hmm. At Kadesh, Israel rebelled and would not go into the land. Remember that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They did not believe God or listen to him. So, according to verses 28 and 29, what did Moses base his prayer on? On God's promise to them and that those people were his inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but God's great power. He was concerned that people would see what God could do. Moses warned the second generation by reminding them of what they saw. They saw the first generation do. You know, remember what your parents did and look what happened to them. Lessons learned. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so interesting. We're still facing plagues and we're still facing competition from nations mightier or, or that we seem as, see as mightier, getting mightier. I am just just because somebody has background i'm muting all is and when 
I muted my own self. Um, somebody's got background noise, some guy talking. So un unmute when you want to talk, okay? I can't see people's faces. Okay. Oh, thank you, Ray. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 10, theme. Anybody? What does God require of you? I put serve God with all your heart and strength. Yeah. Also says to fear him and walk with him, doesn't it? Any of those words would have been good, right? So Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 11. How do these verses flow from 9? When are we going? At the end of Deuteronomy 9, Moses was speaking about what happened at Horeb, Horebad, okay? Horeb, Horeb. So what did he do? Wasn't that when he had to go back up and get uh, the, the new tablets of stone because he broke the first ones? Yes. Up that mountain again. But and this time, yeah, but this time ahead. Moses had to make the stone tablets. Yeah, he did, didn't he? To replace well, did, the first set. God Go wrote on, didn't God write on them though? Yes. Yeah, God wrote on them, yeah. Yeah, God provided them the first time, but when Moses broke them, he then had to provide them. And God did write on them. He what also had he to make, oh, he also had to make an ark of acacia wood and um, put those tablets in that ark when he came down. Right. And later on, it was overlaid with gold and they called it the Ark of the Covenant, which you all have heard about. And it was placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And that, then the Levites were chosen by God to carry the ark during the wilderness travels. And remember studying all that in, I think it was Numbers, wasn't it? You know, uh, all the families and who had to do what and everything. What was written on the Ten Commandments? Oh, never mind, I just said it. <laughs> written on the tablets were the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I just guess, uh, ask the question and answer it in the same sentence. That's good. And then they turn around. I mean, they almost, I mean, they get the, they say, oh, we'll do everything we say. And then they turn around and and do no-nos again, don't they? But he didn't destroy them because of his covenant. If I had been Moses and seen the power that God had and seen his anger, I don't know if I would have had the nerve to confront him, to confront God with, you know, well, you know, these are your people, and well, you said, didn't you, that, you know, you formed this covenant with them, and you know, it was just somewhat confrontational to me, and I just don't know that I would have had the nerve to do that. Yeah, I think that's why he was picked rather than us. <laughs> that's a good thought. <laughs> I think it shows a lot, too, about kind of like groupthink and the power of a group of people, you know, grumbling and complaining together and, you know, how that can crescendo and feed on, feed on itself. Yeah. But didn't Moses get to see God face to face? So maybe there was something in that, that he could see a more, a bigger picture of God and his mercy and compassion and deal with him on that basis, maybe. Well, and I think there's a friendship there, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know, I know, you know, when we get into Abraham in Genesis, you know, he calls Abraham his friend. You know, I, I think, you know, I mean, when you spend two stenches of 40 days and nights with somebody, you're going to get to know them. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> That's good thought, though. Good thought. You know, and, and. You know, and plus he he knew God's heart, I think, don't you? Well, it brought to me that no matter how badly we mess up and sin before God, we can always go back to him, that he is always ready to listen and for us to confess that 
hey, Lord, I messed up, and would you forgive me and give me strength to try again and do better? Yeah, I mean, I've said that a lot. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know if I would take me back sometimes. That's just, you know. Well, luckily, it's God and not you or me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I say that with, you know, because... Yeah, I've had people tell me, Denise, you're harder on yourself than anybody. Does anybody else relate to that? Yes. Oh, yes. I don't know. It's just, it's, it makes you really sit and think about this stuff, don't, doesn't it? When you, yeah, it does. Sit and I think also, about it. The, I also see what Barbara was saying with Moses' boldness of speaking and interceding as a foreshadowing of what Christ did for us, how he interceded on our behalf in the same manner. And so it's amazing that God would place that picture for us in the Old Testament of a foreshadowing in the New Testament. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we get to verses, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, well, I noticed with the ark, um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis put on the holiness of the ark and all the rules about how they had to carry the ark. And none of that happened until after the people disobeyed with the first tablets. It sort of made me wonder, you know, if they would have just obeyed the first time, would they have had more access to God or, or fewer rules about that whole thing? I don't, I don't know if I'm on Yeah, the no, path. that's, no, that's a good point. We, we, um, um, we have discussed that, you know, what do you all have to say about that for Emily? Would they have been able to hear him better? I don't know. I, th I think it's something to ponder. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, you know, they were, their sin was the reason for the rules. And if they hadn't, been so self-righteous and stiff-necked, then, you know, I'm sure God would have been easier on them. Um, he was disciplining them and correcting them for what they had done. Um, if our children didn't disobey, we wouldn't have to put rules on them. We would, at least the rule might still be there in our mind, you know, don't touch the stove, it's hot. But until they touch the stove, they don't know that. Mm -hmm. And but, well, that reminds me of the fruit in the garden, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if if Eve hadn't hadn't taken the fruit and given it to Adam and hadn't eaten it, then the other things that happened, you know, being tossed out of the garden and have to toil and this that it wouldn't have been there. Um, it, it's like having a child that's easy going and, you know, listens to you and obeys. They probably never know all of the rules that, well, I'm sure they don't know all the rules that would be there that the child that's always into something mm -hmm. has to be told or given. My little daughter, my daughter didn't do much wrong, but she said, I just watched my brother get in trouble all the time and I didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah, that's what I did with my brother. Yeah, he was, really? he was, uh, you yeah. know. I was thinking, thinking, uh, go ahead, Ann. I was thinking what Emily said, um, because that's interesting because, you know, with building, yeah, after they, they sinned greatly, then they had to build, then he ordered, Lord ordered uh, the ark and the gold. And eventually that led to people having to go make sacrifices at the temple. And finally we got, we got back to maybe this more of the simplicity with Jesus, but you know, it, like Emily said, if it just if 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 the people were obedient from the beginning, we wouldn't have had all these temple and sacrifices and everything. You know, we've almost come full circle in a way if if we can keep it. Well, you know, another thing, if they had just obeyed him when he said go into this, you know, after the spies came back, remember, and he says go in there and I'll I'll take you know I'm going to go before you. It's going to be taken care of. And they said, oh, no, we can't do that, you know, and they continuously did not believe in God. And that's what he wanted. He wanted them to believe that he was God. 
and he could handle it. If they had gone ahead and done that, they would have been and conquered Israel, been at Israel to conquer it in 11 days. Instead, they had to face judgment, and that judgment was 40 years in the wilderness. Forty years, you have judgment, you have discipline. So we see the difference between God and man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what does the Lord require from his people? Verse 12, let's see, there's chapter 10. I got to turn my yeah, I on. saw that. If to walk in all his ways and serve him and love him with all your heart. I saw so much of that reflected in Micah 6, 8, where he says to do, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. As soon as yeah. I read verse 12, it just immediately, my mind went to Micah 6, 8. Yeah, and that is one, everything referenced to, I think even, let's see here. Yeah, in fact, if you even look at the um, concordance for it, or reverence Micah 6, 8. Yeah. To walk in his ways. What does it mean to walk in his ways? I think I did word study on that, didn't I? Isn't that to just live day by day to please him? Mm -hmm. I would think to walk in his ways would mean that we strive to be like him. And, you know, they were so hard-hearted and so stubborn. I don't know that they were trying at all. It is interesting you said be stubborn because verse 16 in the ESV that I'm using without a concordance says be no longer stubborn. Oh, goodness. And so often that's me. Wow. I'm just stubborn. I know. Thank you, Ray. Now that I've got that to think about all day. So. <laughs> yeah, because if we walk his way, we're not walking in our own way, our own stubborn way, are we? Walk sin signifies living day by day. His ways are learned from his word. Living life day by day according to what the Lord says. Lives of obedience. That's walking in his ways. To love him. I mean, and it's interesting. I mean, God, God expected them to obey him. He told them to obey him. These were people that had been told to obey all their yeah. life. And beat yeah. when they did it, you know, and all. And yet they still struggled. I mean, that shows the depth of our human, uh, uh, the inbuilt uh, tendency towards sin, I think. In Deuteronomy 6, God commanded his people to love him with their, their whole heart and demonstrate that love by obeying him. Isn't that what Jesus said too? If you love me, you will obey me. Keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. Serve him with all your heart and soul. What does that mean? To serve? But to serve with the right attitude. Mm -hmm. Not as uh, though it's uh, uh, a job or to uh, it's toilsome, but to serve lovingly and obedient with an obedient heart. One definition read to be in bondage to or to labor for. Hmm. Yeah, that's important to remember. It's, it, it is a physical thing. When focus of labor is the Lord, when the focus of labor is the Lord, it is a religious service to worship him. Moreover, in these cases, the word does not have condemnations of tolsome labor, but instead a joyful experience of vibration. It should be joyfully done. And not complain. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you don't have any, if you're full of joy doing something, have you ever done something and, you know, say, you know, serving at lunch or something, you know, at church or something, and you just have fun doing it? Mm -hmm. Loving and serving convey a heart attitude, not just a cold-hearted keeping of a list of laws and commands. And that's eventually what the Jewish people have done over and over and over again, isn't it? 
and to keep his commandments. I, I just think this one, you know, this one verse has so much in it, doesn't it? Do you see all that? The Lord requires obedience. He required it of Israel and requires it in the New Testament believers. It hasn't gone away, y'all, has it? So, Denise, when you're talking about joy of serving the Lord, in my life, I've seen that sometimes I have the most joy in serving the Lord when nobody else knows. You know, you're helping somebody or doing something that's going to benefit somebody else, and nobody knows it, that I'm the one that did it, but I know, and God knows. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things I've got the most joy, not when everybody knows that you did it and kind of pats you on the back. Yeah. And that's doing it with the right heart, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, but I wish I could say it. That's how I do it all the time. But I it's know, I know. <laughs> it's a pickle, isn't it? There's a, there's a verse, I think, in Handel's Messiah, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I know that comes from the Bible, but I don't know exactly where, but that, you know. Jesus says that. Yeah. I, I don't remember the, I'm not good at remembering too many times the verses. All right, in 14 through 22, what did we learn in Deuteronomy 10? Well, I kind of learned that God gives us everything and, and not to take it that it's what we did, is, but that is what he did as a kind of a general summation to me. Mm -hmm. He speaks about justice in 18. He, God administers justice for the fatherless widow, loves a stranger, giving him food and clothing. And just like you were, you know, in Egypt, strangers, um yeah well the the heaven highest heavens and the earth all belong to god right he set his affection on israel and chose to love them and this is the same with the christians in the new testament moses called israel to circumcise their hearts again he's saying that obedience it's to come from the heart from a love and reverence of the Lord. Understand who he is and why to love and fear him. Why do we love and fear him? Well, it is because he is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awesome God. He doesn't show partiality or take a bride. He executes justice for everyone. He is your praise and your God. He is the one who has done great and awesome things, which Israel saw. Has anyone seen him do great and awesome things in your life? Yes, but I don't want to elaborate on what they are because he's done things for me that I thought was impossible. I know. Isn't that awesome? I, you know, he's done the same for me. You know, if, if you really, if you look, you can see it. Does that make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, look at the glasses half full, not ha half empty. You know, sometimes I have a tendency to do it the opposite. Yeah, me too. You know, something that just came to mind is often, you know, if I, I, I misplace things and I can't find them and I've got so sooner and sooner or quicker and quicker, I go to God and say, God, you lead me to them. And one time I couldn't find my keys. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I said that prayer, God, I don't know where they're at. Would you just lead me to them? And I was walking by the garbage can in the living room, little garbage can we have. And it's just kind of by itself. It's not like it fell off the table. But I thought, well, let's look in the garbage can. And there the keys were. And there's no reason why they should have ever got there. It's not like they fell off a table into it. So no, they jumped on the, They jumped in that trash can. Didn't you know that? Yeah, but it's just a reminder to me, little things like that, a reminder to me is you can take everything to God in prayer. I do that too, Ray. Does anybody else do that? I, I, you know, I misplace things, you know. I think I put it in a good place, and then I can't remember where that place is. 
and I go to God and I'll say God and it's like I just put it out of my mind and then within five minutes almost every time it pops up one time when we were camping um, we lost the key to our RV we were locked out when we went running it was a tiny little key in the middle of this huge trails and we prayed and we found it it was in the middle of nowhere and hidden in the grass. I can't, I could not. Oh my gosh. It. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to get back in our RV. So oh. God is good. He's awesome. I wanted to say something about that last line you had. You said discussing God's character, who he is, what he's like and his ways. It goes back to something, Denise, you said about how we go to God and ask things. Our pastor had given this really great analogy. He said, growing up, he knew the rules of his home. He knew that he could never stay out past a certain time mm -hmm. or else he would get into trouble. So he knew because his parents had certain standards, he wouldn't even ask them, can I stay out till 3 a.m.? Because I knew what the answer would be. He said, if we know God's character and we know who he is and it helps guide our prayer life because we know what we can go to him and ask and what we can't. And I thought that was a really neat way of looking at it, a great analogy. Then we only get that through what Barbara said by studying his word. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you, Michelle. That's really good. Yeah, because we have to know him, but the only way to know him is to re read his story, which is what this bible is all about it's his story i never thought of that i wish i read this much when i was much younger you know well i tried to read it i just didn't understand it <laughs> you know i mean because i think without the holy spirit you can't understand it this you when, know what i mean when i had children at home i called it the instruction book to the kids because mm -hmm. I said, you have to read the instructions to know how to do something. And I made that point to them, and now they're grown men. So apparently something stuck because they're not in prison or dead. Yeah, you always kind of wonder about your kids, don't you? Oh, well, goodness gracious. I used to say if you can li get them to live through their teenage li lives, you, you, you've done good. Oh, Deuteronomy good 11. Him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what, what do you have as um, chapter theme for Deuteronomy 11? God gives food and rain. Ah. Anybody else? Well, I must have been stuck on a theme because I have for this one also love and serve the Lord. <laughs> And God, God disciplines those that he loves. Yeah, he does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He also has blessings. And what and Michelle curses. was saying, teach your children. Yes. This is um, a chart on day five will help you get through these verses. 11 through, 1 through 17. What does it tell us about the Israelites. What is Moses saying in here? And about God. Don't make me pick someone. What What are the promises of obedience to God's commandments? Mm-hmm. Well, I picked uh, out of that, oh, year one through seven, I jumped down to 13, so sorry. I'll back off. Thank you. <laughs> the Lord multiplied Israel into a great number of people that existed at that time, even though he put to death an entire generation of evil and unbelieving people. God did great things and awesome things, which the new generation had seen with their own eyes. Therefore, they should love their great and awesome God and always keep his commandments. Verse 2 is a reminder to Israel that they had seen the Lord's discipline. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? Is the discipline. What's a description of him, God, and his great works he did in the wilderness in verses 2 through 7? He disciplined. You saw his greatness. His mighty hand, 
his outstretched arm, his signs and works in Egypt. He parted the Red Sea and engulfed the Pharaoh's army. He disciplined Israel in the wilderness. And there was um, two of them that were ones who spoke against the priesthood. The earth opened up and swallowed them and all that was theirs. Can you imagine what a sight that would have been? And that God is still the God of discipline. What's the result that you should have out of discipline? What when is discipline for? Self control. Self control? Yeah, I was gonna say to teach you what it was right. Yeah, instruction. And so that you would fear and obey. Yeah. And that fear is a reverence. It's not, oh, I'm scared, you know. It's, you know, it's, it's um, reverence. I, mean, I guess that's just the best word, isn't it? Okay, we got to get along. Discipline. What is discipline? Okay, we've done that. The chart on day five on commands. What is the command in verses 8 through 12? Well, that you should keep all the commands that he's giving you. Yeah, and you'd live long in the time of the land, right? And that they would live for... Pros prosper. Yeah, prosper, yeah. God himself would water the land. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we'll get to that in a minute. What are the commands and the warnings in the, in the verses 13 through 17? Well, the command is... Oops. The command is to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he'd give them rain that would produce grass for the cattle and food for the people. Today, the land of Israel does not get very much rain at all. I mean, when we were there, they were told that they get two to four inches a year. There's much irrigation done. They're actually draining the Dead Sea and filtering out the water to use it. So... They're not getting much rain at all. I wonder why. Just saying, you know. The warning begins in verse 16. What does it tell us? Don't be no deceived. Gods. No other gods before me. Yeah. Make sure that their, our hearts aren't deceived to worship other gods. The result will be God's angry because there will be no rain on the land and they would perish. 18 through 25, what are these verses about? Well, I like verse 18 because it talks about to store up these commands in your heart so you'll know them. Yeah. I like that word. If you impress his words, you yeah. know, I would like that and word. I'll, Go ahead. And it also wants you to teach your children. Yes. Hold fast to them and drive out all the nations. It reminds me of uh, Deuteronomy, what was it, 4-9? Um, that tells you, uh, make this stuff known to your sons and your grandsons. So no, we're not done when we're done raising our kids. Then you've got grandkids to teach. Yeah, if you get to see them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you know. Then we you know, went into, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, well, this, this age, you know, everybody lives so far. Off. The blessing is if you listen and obey God's commandments. Curse if you, they don't listen and turn away to other gods. You know, and today, what could those other gods be? Well, it could be success or money or leisure time. That I just want to do what I want to do. It could be lots of things. Yeah. Career. Power. Career. Did someone say prayer? No, I said career. Oh, oh. career. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's Southern. <laughs> That's Southern. Well, I'm like, sorry. Georgia has spoken. Okay. <laughs> this was for the, when he's talking about it, it was for when they entered the land, you know, which, so how does this relate to the body of Christ in New Testament believers? I have ants up here. The dead ant. 
God still expects us to love him and serve him with our whole hearts. Yeah, he really does. And obey him, yes. fearing him from yes. as the great and awesome only God. Yes. Yeah. One true and living God. Okay. Now she's going to stop. What happens to the rebellious, the stiff neck? And I'm going to think of you everything I every time I hear stiff neck. Do you know that? I, I never knew, understood it in this way before, so. No, it's new to you, yeah. And this is kind of, this, you know, even though, and Emily, I, I felt, Emily, have you studied um, Numbers and Deuteronomy? I mean, Leviticus and Numbers? No, I jumped in with John over the winter when we were stuck with COVID. Yeah. And um, this course i i did think to myself this might be better after studying the others but it was what was available and i didn't want to go without something so i thought well, well studying go. deuteronomy is better than not studying something yeah so. i hope you're not too lost because um by studying numbers in leviticus or leviticus numbers um you get so much of the background yeah i you know i i'm so glad to just have something because oh. <laughs> there's just with the covid there is everything is shut down so this is just this is great. <laughs> and you're in Pennsylvania. Yeah, they're yeah. pretty well shut down still, aren't they? Yeah. <sighs> well, I was wondering that because I was sitting there talking to my husband and I go, I just wonder, you know, because we have the background, you know, as, as I'm we sure studied I'm not it. getting out of it what everyone else is, but it's, it's well, no, so I can, and, and oh, no. You're, you're seeing it all wrapped up, I think, in Deuteronomy. Yeah. Well, and I'm so yeah. excited to go back to the second part of John in the fall after getting all this background in Deuteronomy because Jesus talks so much about the things and it, it's, it's all just the dots are starting to connect. And I know there's more dots that I'm not seeing, but I'm, I'm happy for the dots I have. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Well, good, good. I was just, you know, um, wondering about you um, yeah. because uh, I, I know how that, you know, when you're sitting there and you're getting well, why aren't they going over the Ten Commandments? Well, we've been over, we've done that, you know. Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of wondering. So good, that that's encouragement for me. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to stop this recording.